was uh, an equal in the ecosystem. So what is this and why should we care? And like, is this yet another talk about yes, APIs are a business thing? No, it's not. So like, my background is in, um, I've been doing 10 years in uh, public sector. I was in the Minister of Agriculture and First Grade in Finland, uh, doing the assistance when uh, Finland entered the European Union. And we kind of like, we went there straight, uh, first year university students. We had to build some systems. We did not know anything what we were doing. Uh, but we came up with these web services. It was super cool. Nobody knew what they were, but we kind of made them work. They still work. Um, then we, I was in a, a, a soft ERP company doing some global ERP stuff. Then I was in a big retailer. And then uh, I renewed an IT. Uh, company or IT consultancy company studies from integration to APIs. And now I'm running my own company with my team, ever growing, and uh, I would do a lot of training and I would do a lot of consulting and sometimes even architecture. Uh, I can code uh, pretty decently, but I'm actually a master of uh, education, not computer science, which actually helps because the people are the problem, <laughs> not the tech. Uh, so uh, I had one customer in one workshop saying that now I get it. API doesn't actually stand for application programming interface. Guess what it stands for? All people are important because all people are important to make actual business with actual APIs. Um, so the book that we wrote, we actually wrote it in Finnish, just to annoy people who think that English is the only language in the world. I'm sure that this audience here can understand that. Uh, but we then translated it into English because Ronnie Mitra, who is actually talking after me today, uh, was staring at the Finnish book in one conference and was like, there are no pictures in here. I said, well, there are some pictures, but this is for adults. This is not a picture book, darling. So then we had to translate it into English so that Ronnie would also be able to read it and some of you too. Okay, but what is then uh, an ecosystem and why should companies care about it? Well, the answer that I have to explain a lot in the Nordics and, and elsewhere in the far north is that yes, we companies, we need other companies to actually prosper. There is actually scientific research on that. Like other, uh, else, the Googles and Apples and every else in the world that we envy out there are going to take over our business. And so if we actually cooperate together, it makes for better business. And this is how I live and breathe with all the uh, like startups out there uh, being a startup ourselves, but also with the really, really big companies. Uh, my company wouldn't thrive if we wouldn't have partnerships with really, really big companies who could be actually our competitors, but we have made a, a way to live with them. So in Estonia, they also made this uh, nice research and actually some Finnish researchers were doing that, and they basically said that a collective manner creating platforms to promote one another's products and services is actually a much better way to do business. And the thing is that most companies stop at doing this because our product is better than the others. Our company needs to make profit. How can we play with others because that will take away something from us instead of like creating something new and creating something more. The problem is that this kind of thinking is screwing up our APIs <laughs> because like I was uh, coming into this big retail company uh, to do APIs and they kind of took me in because I knew the tech. And I said, well, I can fix the tech, but the problem is that I need to fix your partnership strategy, I need to fix your uh, program management, I need to fix your budgeting because you guys are budgeting in a weird way that doesn't suit APIs. And a lot of other things need to be fixed, even the key structures. We fix them in six months because we have to, because the business models were changing and we just have to get something working. But to this day, that company still doesn't have a clear partnership strategy regarding APIs. They do partnerships in all other fields, but not with APIs. And that's kind of like a bit of wasted time and money in that sense. 
So why is this important? Because actually research says that APIs are thriving in cultures where uh, the marketing and software engineers are actually talking to each other. And why does that matter? Because it creates, uh, like, the amount of APIs correlates with the global startup growth index. So, actually, I talked with Dimitri Mavridi, who is in the public sector room, or should have been there, but <laughs> got uh, stuck in the traffic. And he was actually uh, going to continue with this research that Marco Teppanen, who was one of the co authors with me with this book, was uh, starting with this bunch of good scientists, and I think that we should all pay attention to that result. The thing is that obviously, uh, in companies where we discuss APIs, and even if we know what the API is, and we know all the technical details of it, there are lots of people who think that API is just another way of doing integration, or API is equal to an app, or they are like talking about making apps, because apps are pretty, they have nice colors, buttons, everything, and they are much sexier. You, you get rewarded for making a good app, but who is standing there in the like podium with, with a good API? Nobody. I actually had a, a discussion with a person once for 30 minutes. I thought I was talking about APIs. I thought she was talking about APIs, but it turns out she was talking about apps. So it gets a little bit confusing, and that is what we should remember when talking to other people, that they possibly don't know anything about what is an API, and even less about what is API economy. So API economy, we had to actually make a definition of it to the book, because there was no definition. There were like white papers from companies trying to sell us a lot of stuff around APIs, but there really wasn't a scientific uh, definition for it. So the fundamental thing here is that you can actually save time and money or create some value uh, by, by using other people's APIs, but you also have to remember that there are those developers. So you're actually doing business to developers, and that's the fundamental difference, like Pauline was telling us in the previous talk, that the developers are actually very weird people. Who is a developer here? Mm -hmm. Yes, you guys. Marketers just don't get you. <laughs> and we had this uh, funny discussion with the London-based um, service design company. They're a super cool service design company, but they were stuck with a project because they were asked to build a world-class platform for a known company, and they were needing to design the developer experience for that. But the problem was that the service designers didn't have a clue what the developer is <laughs> or what the de developer does or actually what is coding or anything related. And so to design a developer experience from that point was proving a bit tough to them. And they called for help. We had a phone call. They're like, oh my God, this is what it means. And then they, off they went. And I kind of wish them luck, but let's see what happens because it's not that easy. Um, a lot of companies get the developer experience wrong uh, without understanding what is related to that, but also the business model is wrong related to APIs. So uh, a lot of times we hear that API is a product. API should be treated as a product. Yes, that is kind of true, uh, at least a product by service, but actually what does the API do within your product, within your service, or as a connection to your existing human service or other technical service. So because you can use actually APIs to order, for example, uh, translations or transcriptions. We had a US-based company uh, as a customer. They were actually selling these like YouTube and heart surgeon and whatever transcriptions from audio and video files. And they were stuck with their API and developer experience because they needed to sell their services, but they just couldn't figure out what was wrong with their API and why people get got stuck, why they were actually getting a lot of customer uh, requests about stuff, like 50% of their customers were getting stuck without being able to use the API without help, and they couldn't figure out why. Because of poor developer experience. The mistake number one was that they hadn't figured out first with their marketing, with their business, what is the role of the APIs in their business? So they had a very nice website, good business, great quality, 
But when you tried to find out their API from their website, you couldn't. When you finally found it with Google, you go to the developer site, and then uh, there was some nice technical writer who had wrote, written the documentation, which was completely wrong from a technical point of view. Like, if you were stuck on, on getting started page, you were like literally getting lost in the mistakes and in the prose of it, because it was reading like a novel and not like a technical documentation. So there's a lot of stuff that you need to consider when productizing your APIs, but also when you think about the role of the APIs in your business. Um, and then there's of course that confusing thing that what is internal, what is open, what is, you know, uh, the word <coughs> open API is causing so many headaches to people because people think, business people especially, that open API means that everything is open. You know, everyone can like use our data, use our product, use our like trade secrets, and of course that's not true. So open API is public and partner API, which are not that public. Like they're public and maybe available in the internet and available for those who have purchased your service or uh, your product, but not completely public. And then there's that open data interface that is super confusing because sometimes you do serve APIs with open data, but it's not always so. So you have to actually, as a provider, consider your data models, your licensing models, your interface protection. Is it a cool thing if somebody sees what your API looks like, or should you require them to actually log in first? Um, because you can't actually patent an interface description. So a lot of legal stuff going on. But then, what are those things that you actually can expose with APIs? So we had, um, we had to do some research on, on the uh, available resources. Like we talk about APIs being resources, but what resources to what? So you have Fleming's uh, thesis that says that everything, every resource in the internet should be exposed um, as a RESTful resource. But then these are probably all uh, physical resources that you can actually expose with APIs. Uh, we have to actually update this uh, table from an older research because there was no API grade uh, research on this. And then, of course, the problem when we are talking about going to the ecosystem side of things. So we talked about APIs, what is an API? What is the business model of APIs? Um, or what is the business model of your company? And then you relate APIs to that. But then what about the ecosystem? So do all the ecosystem parties, I mean, you basically call almost anything an ecosystem. And the thing is that if you don't have the same goals and direction, it's not a real ecosystem, it's mm -hmm. not a living ecosystem. So for those who have definitions, the ecosystem is made up of multi-layered group of partners, all of whom and their interactions are needed to materialize a key ecosystem value proposition. Sounds very difficult, but Abner is actually the leading uh, scientific researcher doing studies on ecosystems, and that's what he means. You need to have a common reason for actually doing that. And then, this is the thing, we all talk about customer journeys, and we all talk about API with them, but what does that really mean? Whose customer journey? Whose customer experience? In an ecosystem, you kind of have to let go of the idea of owning that customer experience, like the end customer experience alone. So you have to actually have an idea in your head that we as a company are providing one of those spots in a ecosystem. We have our core capabilities and we are exposing that as an API. But we can buy, rent, steal, borrow all the other stuff. Like we were doing this big retailer uh, webshop uh, some years ago and the thing was that actually what we did was that we only did these couple of APIs there, like product availability, uh, stores, that sort of stuff. We did those by ourselves. Everything else, we borrowed and steal them, whatever, uh, rented, because we just didn't have any time. The business side of uh, the company was sitting on their butts, so to speak, 
uh, for six months. And we're fighting over the business models because they needed to change them. And then they remember that, oh, sh uh, we need IT <laughs> to actually make this happen. <laughs> so like, <laughs> we actually need something done. We don't re really know what, but we need something done. And so we had three months to renew a workshop in three countries, one of them being Russia, which was funny because then we found out that we didn't have any, uh, like we needed Russian APIs. And that's another story that I can share in the break. But let's just say that I know a lot of hardware stuff, like real hardware, like the stuff that you use for building houses in Russia right now, because I have to test the API. But the idea is that your customer journey needs to be built for the ecosystem, and you might not know exactly, your company might not know exactly what is that customer journey going to be like, because you might not be building it, you might not be owning it, and that's the frightening thing for your management team your marketing, your sales. Oh my God, what, what do we do now? Now, <laughs> this was from one of our customer cases related to that customer case. We had a pet store uh, that uh, as a pet platform that was, um, they're, they're, they're heavily doing stuff with data. They're building stuff in multiple countries and there's like cool things going on. But it was funny because we had to actually think about a pet as a value creator, uh, a pet as a mediator of value. What is a pet ecosystem? Have you thought about your pet ecosystem, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> so, so the customer journey uh, when recovering uh, a sick pet is actually very funny because you have like, you know, the dog is sick, you need to uh, call the doctor, you actually post some uh, sad pictures in the social media or something, and then you might go to the insurance company or the doctor or whatever happens, and there's a lot of data exchanged. And when you take universities and gene uh, studies and everything else into the loop, it's pretty interesting. But no company, no organization alone can actually deal with that. So you need to actually think about how the customer journey goes across all of those um, operations. <coughs> And then you have this, um, I was mixed up with the uh, um, traffic ecosystem. So in Finland, we were the first to create a law without the European Union directive about uh, travel ecosystems. So you had uh, the, all the stuff from buses to taxis to uh, airplanes and trains, and they were setting up a law to connect those into a kind of value chain, into a customer journey where you can actually buy a ticket to all of them uh, from one point or one service provider. And to make that happen, everybody, all the travel operators or traffic operators had to build their APIs and expose them uh, to other parties. And that was not funny because there's like a room full of lawyers, as many as here are in the audience, you people, and they all were fighting over should we or should we not, and how should we build those APIs? Do we really have to expose our prices, our customer data, our everything to all the other traffic operators? How is this going to work? And the guys who made the law were kind of copy pasting it from PSD2, the Open Banking Directive, into a national law. <laughs> which made things even more interesting. But the technical side was, uh, was um, super great because we had to get architecture guidance for a law which was very open in the way that we were supposed to uh, do the test. So uh, the, the publication, by the way, the link to the publication in English uh, about the architecture um, recommendations is in that link. So if if you want to Google that uh, traffic training system, you will probably find it. Uh, then these APIs are the like final point is that you have to get rid of integration orientation. So the thing is, you can't think about one company, one organization, let's integrate with them. You have to say, think about ecosystems and platforms and how that changes your organization because suddenly you will have your internal teams, your external teams, 
uh, your competitors using, using your APIs and building innovation. And you have to figure out how to get those innovations and those things that they're building to your own development and how to do that in the best way and how you organize around it. Uh, your teams and your management and your budgeting and your partnerships and everything else, your sales and, and, and uh, purchasing. And that's, that's kind of a topic for another talk, but <laughs> uh, as a final thing, I have four copies of the book, I have some cards with addresses to these places, and this apncycles.com is a creative commons license method to actually help you build these business-oriented APIs and to get everybody on the same page, the technical and the business persons alike to use methods and language that they will all understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have any questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned internal APIs and yeah. to the conference and in general we should think about our internal APIs as external ones. So how is it different from the API economy? If you build something what is intended to be used internally, but you still should have uh, yeah. say value and economy behind it. That's an excellent question. Uh, and the answer is that the economical value is that there is a research that says internal APIs help you cut costs. Uh, but external APIs, the public partner uh, APIs, help you gain market and get new customers and get new partners. So like, what are your business goals? Like Pauline was saying earlier, what is your business strategy? That's the business you need to figure out, and then you need to figure out what they need. Obviously, there are uh, occasions where your legacy systems are totally like uh, burning up, and you need to do stuff to kind of fix that situation. But in, even in then, it's kind of like a cost reduction versus uh, investment. Again, so yes, economical decisions, even if not. You know, yeah, it's, it's something yeah. that exactly. sales, somehow you, you saw the value of Yeah, and, and with the APL cycles method, actually, there's this, uh, like, it starts with the business model canvas and value proposition canvas, and actually, I've killed a lot of APIs <laughs> with that because sometimes there just is no economical sense, but you don't get it, or, or there's a, a sense to make some APIs that you don't actually consider if you just look at the IT cost. So the trick is to get everybody on the same table to discuss the cost versus the, the revenue or other benefits. Because the cost budget is with IT usually, while the revenue budget or the cost savings for automations uh, or something like that is within the business budget. Like 30 seconds for yeah. one last question yeah. and then we see. I, I will be here for so 25 and something now. <laughs> um, what is your view on API standardization? Do you get an example of CO2 yeah. or this health and transportation? Yeah. But, you know, if it is regulated, then it starts to be, you know, like inflexible. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I am kind of with standards, but with like this open API, JSON schema kind of like schema that all this wonderful. Yeah those kinds of standards, but industry specific standards that you sit on for years and years, and they are old before they are even like set in stone, that's really nice. So if you have standards, please use the ISO and all the other standards who are not like create new data models for the industry, if you can avoid it. But hey, I have those books and you can ask me questions anytime today, I'm going to be here. So let's just get morning on that day.